Because I agreed to that, that, that took me away. Let me go from the beginning. There we go. Now, in the second sort of bit, as, as Walter just said, um, I would like to talk about what I'm calling COVID spirituality as a special case. The, the pandemic has done some extraordinary things in um, bringing people out of the woodwork where they would normally talk, never talk about um, God or religion or faith or any of those things, but COVID has actually made that necessary. And we've had this deluge of people uh, inquiring about all kinds of um, spiritual matters in all kinds of interesting ways. And we've learned a lot over the last 15 or 16 months about um, how people feel, what, th what this has done to people, how they feel God is working in their lives or what they need to uh, encounter God in their lives. And I'll be talking a bit about that. I have quite a lot of material on that. So I'll just try and um, truncate that a little bit so that we've got time to talk about it and share experiences. So I hope that's all right with everybody. Is that what you're expecting more or less? And and um, you're you're okay with that, because if, yeah, if, that, if that's fine, then thank you. I'll, then I'll I'll begin. So, what do we know about contemporary spirituality? Well, the first thing we need to determine is what people outside the church actually want. What are they looking for? And we've done quite a lot of research. The Alistair Hardy Research Centre similarly has done quite a lot of res uh, research into what people say about their spiritual search, their spiritual journey in the contemporary world. And there are quite interesting elements to that, which pose some problems for us as Christians. So for the very first thing that people say is that they want control over it. They want control over their spiritual lives as they like to look for control over other parts of their lives. So that means they want lots of choice. They want the right to change their mind. They want to dip in and out of things. They want to um, pick up things and put things down. And they don't want to be told this is how it works. This is what you've got to accept. So that's what they don't want. They don't want a kind of <clears throat> faith. Excuse me that is kind of delivered to them in a block and that's that's what you've got to buy into or not they want to be able to control how that works in terms of christian faith i sometimes call this jesus as lodger syndrome so instead of as it were uh, in a sort of common parlance of, of christian life we would say that you know we invite jesus into our lives something like that and that, that you know we seek God's will as jesus did in the garden of gethsemane um, people want jesus kind of in their lives but they want him to stay like a lodger in his room and only come out and bless their endeavors as they go along so it's kind of trying to control Jesus in various ways so it's not giving your life to Jesus it's having Jesus along you know to to bless what you you're you're into what you want to do so that control factor that matter of choice uh, is always there and you can see why that's important because um, that exists uh, in, in, in ordinary life you know the, the, the right to have lots of choices to pick things up and put things down and change your mind. The second thing that people want is they want to feel lucky they want to feel that they're on the side of the good and they're able to keep bad things away. So they want basic good fortune in life. They want a kind of sort of ongoing lottery possibility. So I want to feel lucky. I want to feel that, you know, my life's going to turn out well. And I want a spirituality that props that up. So you'll see a lot of people going in for kind of fortune telling or horoscopes or astrology, all those sorts of things where they get sort of positive, happy outcomes. Um, you can imagine that with COVID, however, a lot of psychics are in trouble because they failed to mention it when they <laughs> cast those horoscopes and things. Uh, and a, a lot of people complain, you know, that they had their sort of fortunes told before the pandemic and it never mentioned anything like about getting ill or a, a, a plague <laughs> suddenly appearing over the horizon. But that's what people want. They, they want fortune. And there are plenty of people out there who are going to provide that for them. Another people, another thing that people uh, say that they particularly want is they want to feel good about themselves as human beings and they want to feel good about their bodies. So that means whatever sort of choices they make about their sexuality or how they go about their sex lives. Um, they want to feel that, um, that there's there's no prohibitions around that, that there's, uh, you know, a, a sort of constrictive morality um, shouldn't be imposed on that. And that the decisions they make about themselves and their bodies 
and the rights that are attached to that, those are the things which are spiritual matters. So it's not just a matter of um, human rights, it's also a spirituality issue. So to feel good about myself, I don't want to feel that um, anybody is looking at me and thinking about my choices negatively. And then they will say that they want happiness. Obviously that sort of fits into the feeling good bit and the fortune and lucky bit and the control bit. Happiness and well-being flow from this sense of control, feeling good about yourself and your choices and what you choose to do with your life. Then we also learn from the research that we've done is that people want uh, hope, but they only want a short term hope. It's a bit like the horoscope thing. I want to feel, you know, I'm gonna have a really good week. <laughs> Good but the idea of having a hope that lasts for all your life and for eternity is that's out of range. I want a short term hope because if this week doesn't go very well or this month or this year, then I can always I can always change it. I can always go to someone else who's going to give me another sort of section of hope to look into. So fairly short term sort of hopes. I'm going to have a really good year. I'm going to have a really good relationship for maybe six months with my girlfriend or my boyfriend. Um, but beyond that, you know, I'm not so bothered. The trouble is that this is all very well as long as things are going well. You notice the emphasis here on, you know, happiness and hope and luck and everything. If something goes wrong that you can't control, that isn't lucky, that makes you feel bad, that causes you sadness and takes your hope away, your spirituality cannot prop that up or deal with it. So life crisis, getting ill, having your mum and dad die, um, having, you know, a, a, a death or a serious illness or unemployment or, you know, a really serious life crisis challenges all this. And then we discover that the edifices that people tend to um, create in their spiritual lives, they crumble straight away. So you can see why COVID has been such a big issue here and what it's done. And that's something that we have to consider. Where does where is the point where people say, you know, I've been going along this spiritual pathway, I've been very happy with it, but it's all fallen to pieces. Um, what have you got? What's your hope? How do you get through this? That's that's the tipping point. Okay, I'm trying to make my screen move on to the next one. Oh, there we go. So let me see. Now, I think I've missed one. Let's go back one. Here we are. Yes. We must attach to this um, all the pressures that are going on in our modern society because they drive some of those things that people say they want. So now we're looking at outside pressures in our society, which drive that kind of way of expressing what I want for my spiritual life. And there are four very significant things. Individualization, post-materialism, globalization and money and conce conceptual diversity. And the best way that I can explain those to you, um, which are sort of technical sociological terms, is to, to give you a few examples. So, Individualization is a sense of me first and a sense of um, entitlement, a kind of selfishness, if you like, but it is very much driven by society that you put yourself first over other people. So I'll give you an example. Um, girl called Amrit, who is a, a student at a university, um, yeah. used to go home at weekends and, and help her mum with her grandmother who was sick. And her mum phoned her up and said, Amrit, can you come home this weekend because your, your grandmother's taken a turn for the worst and I, I need some help with her. And Amrit said, um, I'm sorry, mum, but I can't come because I'm having my nails done. Now, that might sound a very sort of selfish way to, to react to your mum who needs help with her mother. But for Amrit, having her nails done is a kind of spiritual necessity. I mean, she actually sees it in those terms. It's about me. I feel much better about myself when I've had my nails done. And it's really important for me to feel good about myself before I can do anything else. So it's not, it's not just a kind of trivial thing. It's quite a big thing. It's a big thing, but it's also a kind of spiritual thing. It makes me feel that I'm... I'm more beautiful, but I'm also more in touch with the world. I feel good about myself. I feel happy when I see these lovely shiny nails. And that enables me to get on with the next thing. That, and it counters the stresses of my being at university and having all the other stuff and having a sick grandmother and those things. So when I get that done first, then I can do all the other things that I'm being asked to do. So that's, that's how kind of how individualization works. 
Post-materialism is about having objects and possessions which contribute to my sense of happiness and well-being and which quite often can have a spiritual significance. So, I mean, I'll give an example of a girl called Sarah who likes to collect small decorated boxes. And when she first started with these boxes, it was just to decorate her flat, to have them in her room. They were sort of empty boxes. But over time, she started to attribute these boxes to having things in them, kind of intangibles like hope and love and peace and you know, those sorts of qualities. And they would be inside the boxes and so whenever she went out somewhere like she went shopping or she went on a date or something like that she would pick a box to take with her which ca carrying around hope or carrying around peace or carrying around luck and these were spiritual objects which she couldn't get on if she didn't have them in her pocket or having them in her handbag so, so suddenly she's having to carry these spiritual objects around with her uh, and, and she didn't have them, things would go wrong. So they're intrinsic to her sense of well-being there. Now, with globalization and money, one, one of the things that happens with globalization, it makes people fatalistic about money and its purchasing power and what it can do. So, for example, I think Walter will have heard this story before, um, I had a chat phoned me at Church House Westminster, um, the, the headquarters of the Church of England where I work, and he said, um, Dr. Richards, can you tell me uh, how much is it going to cost me for eternal life for myself and my family? And I said, what? <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't at first even understand the question, but he said, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll write a check. How much money? I said, it doesn't work like that. And I thought at first, this was a wind up. I thought it was just somebody having a laugh, you know, he's phoning me up and asking me a silly question. But he sounded deadly serious about this. And he kept asking, how much, how much do you want? And in the end, I talked to his, his local minister, his parish priest and said, do you know this person? And she said, oh yeah, yeah, he's, he's been around asking me the same question because everything else in his life he can pay for. He can pay for health care if he needs it. He can, he can pay for private schools for his kids. He thinks it's perfectly natural just to be able to purchase spiritual things. You know, that's what you can buy. And so many people in con contemporary spirituality think that's how it works. You pay a practitioner, you pay a guru, you pay to go on courses, you pay for personal development that has a spiritual you know, element to it. And it becomes normal to think that that's how you get advancement in spiritual life. And so this, this idea of control is also annexed to, I've got purchasing power, I can pay for it. And that's something that, that is it's also, you know, in people's heads when they encounter Christian faith. And finally, um, there's an awful lot now of what we call conceptual diversity. So people keep very different kinds of spiritualities, bits of religions in their heads and pick and mix them and put them together to make a personalized spirituality. So for example, um, there was a woman who, um, whose husband died and she had a Christian funeral. She um, said to the minister afterwards that um, she was very grateful for the funeral and she had given her a lot of comfort uh, that the, the, the truths of the Christian faith had made a lot of difference to her. But the next week she was at the doctor's saying that she was an atheist and that when we die we rot and she was very upset about it. Could she have some antidepressants and later on down the line and this is how I got to hear of it as a matter of fact she went to a medium and said I think I think my husband's spirit hanging around the house you know there's a ghost somewhere I want you to contact the the spirit and discover what it is that I've done wrong or you know need to put right so there are three different stories here one about comfort and help one about you know despair and and misery and one about there's something I've got to put right. But instead of consulting the same person, she just went to three different people and she kept all those three different stories very separate. And yet they're all working in her head at the same time. So the, the minister doesn't know that she's miserable and gone to the doctor. And he, he doesn't know that she is worried about something going on in the house. So he, 
there's no help coming from that area. She's, she's going to different people. One of the things we discover about contemporary spirituality is that people um, spend a lot of time going to different people and annexing these different stories, telling different stories and keeping them all in their heads at the same time. So when the Alistair Hardy Research Centre did um, research with 18 to 25 year olds, they discovered a lot of people who said that they believed in, in Christian faith also believed in reincarnation. So they sort of got reincarnation from other bits of spirituality, from sort of Hindu sort of ideas and Buddhist ideas and so on. They put those together with their Christian faith. And yet they wouldn't normally talk about that in Christian circles, but they've got that floating around in their head somewhere. And that tends to be pretty significant in what we see in contemporary spirituality. So what I've laid out for you now is what people say they want, but also what the drivers are for what they say they won't want. If you're growing up in our society today, here are the drivers that are making you make those choices. So where do people get the things that make them feel happy and lucky and all the rest of it? Well, they could, if they so wished, they could they get those things from um, the world historic religions in one way or another, but they tend to go many, on many occasions to what we call new religious movements, and there are thousands of them in this country, and they're on the rise. Now, I've been doing this job for, for many years now, and when I started, didn't get many inquiries about new religious movements, maybe a few about the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons or the well-known established ones, but now um, I get thousands of inquiries about new religious movements because there are so many of them and many many of them are internet based so these are also called minority religions sometimes sects or people phone up about cults and so on but there's a huge explosion of alternative spiritualities and you just, all you have to do is just plug into the internet just just google it and you'll find all these practices rituals therapies diy spiritualities new age spirituality and huge amounts of internet online groups um, looking into something of, of some spiritual form there are even kind of shops that have spiritual things for sale um in, you know on the sort of well-being and health and beauty sites it, it, it's a kind of add-on um to uh, something that just simply sells beauty products to have something that's got a spirituality label pushes your sales right up and lots of shops have jumped on that so you can buy lots of spiritualized items which make you feel better about yourself but also more in tune with the universe and that, that is an explosion of things that's been going on for a long time. And when I come on to the next bit about COVID, it'd be quite interesting to see how that's morphed into something quite different and perhaps more alarming. But I'll, I'll talk about that in the next bit. So that leads us to ask the question, why don't these people who are searching, are searching for well-being and feelings of happiness and contentment and peace in their lives, why don't they go to the established religions now? Now, we know from the research that we've done that people still ask the big, big questions of life. Why am I here? What's the point of the universe? What is my purpose? Where do I get value and meaning from the experience of my life? But the thing is, these days, most people would sort of... Um, ask their peer group but they would also go and have a look on the internet there's that internet interaction between their their quests that take place uh, on the internet but also what they get from their peer group and new religions and alternative spiritualities are very good at finding spiritual spiritual niches so people who are looking for something have watched a particular tv program who talk in a particular way or like a particular sort of music there, there'll be a group that has found a niche there for the people who are asking <laughs> spiritual questions in that area and they can do that because they're highly adaptive um, they're quite fluid, they can change overnight. Lots of groups change their names, um, they find a, a catchier, more interesting sort of title by following, say, influencers on Instagram, that sort of thing, and they set up a group that reaches out to a particular set of people, and those people kind of flow into those, um, those areas. And they may not last very long, a year, 18 months, and then they simply morph into something else. They go with the times, they adapt, they, they make themselves marketable, they make themselves attractive, they know how to use social media. And established religions are not good at that pace of change. 
as I'm sure we all know, you know, you don't, you can't just tear up your theology overnight. You can't just tear up the way that you uh, ha have, your, you know, your denomination is structured. You can't change your leadership overnight and simply look at the market strategy and just flow into that really, really quickly. Uh, established religions take a long time to respond to what's going on out there. And that's an interesting question about where we are positioned in relation to that. How are we going to respond fast enough and effectively enough to be able to, to pick up where people are flowing? Because when, when we try that, we discover they might have flowed off to somewhere else. It's fast, very fast changing. But new religions and alternative spiritualities also spend a lot of time researching interests in things like health and well-being, things like healing uh, and uh, people's sense of entitlement in the sense of feeling special. So a lot of these new religions will suggest that you have particular gifts, um, that you're one in a million and that they can train you or that they can uh, promote you to uh, a higher spiritual plane because you have these special gifts so you know it's like it's like really sort of really fast vocational <laughs> processing as it were but without any kind of proper um, structure it's just just to entice you in and make you feel that you you can get to the top of this um this, this spiritual practice, whatever it might be. So that, that could be something to do with yoga, but it could also to be a personal development movement in which you discover your relationship with the universe, get in touch with your soul, find your guardian angel um, and, and communicate with, with the angel, that sort of thing, that sense of elitism and specialness and special spiritual um, uh, end point. That you, that you get to. A bit like Scientology has clears, you know, people who have advanced so far that they, they no, no longer have um, any of the problems associated with being, being human. They're, they've become a kind of superhuman or a supernatural being. So lots and lots of these practices and therapies have a spiritual element because they find that it works. People pay for uh, courses, therapies, practices, personal trainers of one sort or another because they have this spiritual element. It's attractive. It's part of the zeitgeist. But on the other hand, there's all we mustn't forget that there are a lot of spiritual seekers who come from a Christian background or are interested in Christianity, or are just drifting about on the kind of boundaries of the Christian faith. And it's easy when talking about new religious movements and alternative spiritualities to forget that there are an awful lot of those Christians out there. And that they too are engaged in the spiritual search in the way that I just described, wanting a sort of control and happiness and love and peace and all that stuff, but also being affected by the sociological pressures and therefore having an uneasy relationship with the Christian church and the way that the Christian church talks about itself or expresses itself. So we have to remember there's quite a lot of invisible Christians out there. They're invisible to church practice. They don't come to church. They are Christians who do not come to church, but they are people who are, they come from a Christian background or their parents were Christian or they've had some sort of Christian upbringing. Um, their spirituality is framed around the Christian faith, but it's quite frail because it has no root in an actual Christian community. They're invisible to us because they simply don't appear. They, perhaps they might appear at Christmas or something like that, but then that doesn't mean they're not there and it doesn't mean that they're not searching. So they turn up in some of these alternative groups, but their background is spirituality and if you, um, is Christianity. If you remember what I just said about conceptual diversity, there are a lot of people around who have a compartment in their head which is, is Jesus shaped, which is that's what they're searching for, that's what they want. Um, and so we might actually see them visibly but in a completely different context and that's something that we can work with that's something that they have there that's in common but they may not offer it to you if they've got these other things going on so that's one thing to be aware of then we have what we i call fringe christians they are uh, they are visible to some extent so they're sort of floating around the um, the out the outside of, of the christian year they might appear at harvest or, Chris, or christmas or easter um, 
they might they might come along to the odd thing to say a prayer or you know in some traditions they'll light a candle or um they'll want to perhaps come to a bible study or, or the, perhaps they've got children so they'll come to a, um, a parent and toddler group something like that they are friendly to church but they're not church goers so they're on the fringe and we encounter them on odd occasions and similarly, they are very prone to alternative spirituality practice as well. So they might go home and do rituals or say prayers or follow something online. Then we have lapsed and leavers. And I'm afraid that's one of the things, at least in the Church of England, we're very worried about now because um, we've got some research being done by Benita Hewitt at Nine Dot, which suggests that a lot of people who've sort of clung on to the church during COVID are going to leave and not come back. And that's quite a serious issue now. Uh, and one of those things might be because they feel that the church hasn't given them what they needed to get through COVID and they would rather go elsewhere. So that is one element of it. If I feel that, you know, my ongoing spiritual life is better served by internet religion or internet groups or groups in the community that practice differently then that's a challenge to the christian church in opening up again and um as it were representing its faith to people then we have a lot of interested people but who want to stay anonymous so they don't want to kind of um they don't want to kind of uh, stand up and be counted if you like the trouble is that the church is often a lot about counting I, and certainly in the church of england we spend all our time counting people as far as i can see um these people don't want to be counted why would they want to be counted and we've got a, had a lot of those during covid um who have joined through our online church so online church services have been going on and you've got people who have been kind of um downloading the links and watching it later but not actually popping up and saying i'm part of this but actually i'm you know i've been following it and similarly um people who are interested in, in what christian output has been um over the last 16 months or so but are hidden they've, they've they've actually sort of concealed who they are um and we can't know about them it's difficult to to find out who actually has that interest and we have to think about how that works then we have Christians who, uh, because of the, the sort of sociological pressures that we have, see the church as service users. So we're, we're there, there to provide services. We're there to provide baptisms and, and funerals and weddings, but uh, on their terms. So, for example, um, I have a friend at Ely Cathedral who said that um, uh, she uh, agreed to baptise a couple's child. And when they came to talk about the baptism, the, the, the dad said, um, yeah, thanks, Vicky, very much. But do you think you could leave out all the God stuff? And well, she said, well, well, no, that's kind of a deal breaker for baptism. <laughs> you know, we don't leave out the God stuff. He said, well, I, well I, I get that. But the thing is, you know, I've got family coming who don't believe in any of that and they'll, they'll be put off by it. Which is, well, I'm, I'm very sorry, but, you know, this really is a deal breaker. He said, well, OK, that's fine. I'm, I'm not coming then. So that's, you know, it, it was this service provision. You, you provide me with what I want and I control the content of it. And we get increasing amounts of that, uh, particularly around the occasional offices. So there's people who, who are used to being you know, given what they want in shops and at work and all those sorts of things. And uh, they, they see that the church uh, actually give them those things. But the other side of that is cold contacts, which is what we call people who come along, for example, to a baptism or a wedding or a funeral. Um, the warm contacts are the people who've actually come and asked for it. The cold co contacts are the people who come along and attend. And many of those are spiritual seekers who you know, have unanswered questions, but they're never given an opportunity just because they're attending as part of a wedding party or a baptism party to say, actually, I've got this on my mind. But often those occasions are particular flashpoints for people thinking, I'd like to find out more about that. But where do they get the opportunity to, to say just tentatively, you know, tell me a bit more about that. Where do I explore that a bit more? And finally, we get loads and loads of people from a Christian background who've left the church or, you know, are not churchgoers who simply say, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. 
Uh, I don't buy into all this stuff that you have going on. Um, I've, I'm, I've got a much freer, looser spirituality than that. Um, and that's that's where I want to go. So I don't I don't want what you're offering me if it's not um, if it doesn't fit into my much more sort of uh, fluffy spirituality, my DIY pick and wick sort of spirituality. So that's a very common sort of starter point. Often when I say what I do, I say, well, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. As, and that's, that's my, you know, that's, I, I get to know that's where their starting point. So one of the things that we've been working on in the area of new religious movements is exactly how, what what's the proper principles for engaging with people who come from this kind of background and what i would suggest are first of all there's some quite important things that we need to have and one of them is clarity about what we believe so when people actually ask us are we absolutely clear about what the christian faith means what it teaches uh, who Jesus was, what the Bible is about, you know, very basic sort of stuff. But what, what's the clarity? Because if you come across as muddled, confused, or, um, you know, you just think, actually, I've never thought about that, then it's, it's difficult for people to, to ask questions because they feel that, um, you, you know, they're putting you on the spot and that's not fair. And similarly, you need to have some sort of confidence, confidence in our faith are we really confident that you know we we as christians you know know where we're going know what we're about and how does that confidence come across but when i say clarity and confidence to some people that means a kind of triumphalism and i think that's probably unhelpful because we need some honesty about what we believe um, and that includes all the things that perhaps we don't know so that goes into the next one about knowledge it's okay not to know stuff it's okay and that's what I mean about clarity the clarity also includes what, what, what I don't really know what I don't really you know get about Christian faith the bit where faith has to do the work um, and so we have to respect other people where they're coming from what what what, what they believe um, and rather than just sort of say oh that's rubbish we have to kind of engage with that and respect where they've been in their experiences so for example and this will go with the sort of reserving judgment bit as well i get people who leave new religious movements who've had a really really bad time in fact i've got one of my books at the moment where a person has been in a very very controlling group and has lost a lot of money and lost a lot of confidence but the trouble is um her parents kind of want to say oh well you made a big mistake there come back to church and everything be fine and that's that's a bit difficult because she made some friends there were some good things in her experience and she wants to take those away with her and the, the feeling to be made to feel that you're a failure that you made a really bad mistake and to be kind of judged for that because you, you left the christian fold for a while that's very painful and it doesn't help people get back into a, a you know a reasonable relationship with their christian faith so we need a bit of humility a bit of empathy for people who are struggling with their you know, their spiritual choices so far they've hit a life crisis maybe or they've been badly treated and uh, they you know they need pastoral care but we also need vigilance because there is no doubt that there are new religious movements out there that do harm to people so you know i've been talking about this sort of fluffy want to feel good happy lucky and all the rest of it but there are groups that actually prey on that and draw people in and do them tremendous harm tremendous psychological harm sometimes actual physical sexual harm um because you know they can draw people in and make them feel that uh, they have to behave like this so that's one of the things we have to watch out for it's not just that people are switching from this this sort of uh, set of belief to that sort of set of belief sometimes they've actually encountered actual spiritual abuse spiritual harm um, and there are safeguarding elements in there as well of course which we have to take into account so we need vigilance we also need charity for people who've been hurt and it is important to have discernment about exactly what has gone on in a person's life what they need to take away with them what they need to get rid of or be healed from and that's you know an important side of it and finally i would just suggest that the distinctiveness of the christian faith can be a tremendous help to people 
when, when they hit this crisis, when they have been hurt, when they are in a place of worry and despair and anxiety, that the distinctiveness of Christian faith and what it gives us to be able to endure is very important to people. And so, well, I won't go to that now. I think I'll pass that over to you. So I thought perhaps in the time that we have left now, so it's nearly 10 to 11, if we go on till about um, just after 11, since we started a bit late, I thought perhaps um, I would like to receive from you some any comments, ideas or questions about what I've said so far or anything that resonates with your own experience. But also, I'd like to hear from you, what skills do you think we need to have effectively to engage with people who come from this sort of background? Now, that next slide I was going to show you has some ideas on there, but I think I'll start with you and see what, he, what you say, and then we'll come back to that just before the end. Is that okay? Yes, it's yes, fine. Yes, that's fine. Yes. 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 Mm. Don't fire away. Who wants to start? Um, Anne, I really would like to challenge you slightly on, on, on one of your, your premises about spirituality. I really rather mm -hmm. feel that um, uh, within the human race, there's a sort of very essential universal spirituality, which is connected to our where we come from in terms of our creation. And that mm -hmm. deep down, we are all spiritual creatures. Mm -hmm. um, tap into different elements of uh, receptiveness and mm -hmm. received sources of spirituality um so kind of um i, don't, I can't really quite uh, um agree with, with, with the sort of the, your, your 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 definition um or, or the, uh, to start with the other thing it was is to, is to do with um worship and church um mm -hmm. i think one of the problems that the, the churches have or the christian faith has and I like to think really much more in terms of what we follow as being uh, for our, as us being followers of faith rather than religion. Uh, and, uh, is that um, people see religion and church as sort of ha habitual exercises, and I think people want to be uh, experience a faith which has more freedom. Mm -hmm. And if we can kind of um, preach more about uh, uh, guiding people and direct people and then invite people into um, a, a more freedom style relationship uh, which isn't necessarily bound around um, habitual practices uh, and look at uh, worship um, and faith as more a day one to day seven event Monday to Sunday mm -hmm. rather than a Sunday and the church is the place you go to and that but, but because church isn't the place you go to we all know that we are the church on the move every day mm -hmm. every minute of our lives and so, really, I think the message we should be actually trying to kind of convey in terms of our uh, invitation, this is an invitation. And by the way, in order to get an invitation or put, put an invitation out, you have to build a relationship with people. So you have to get their trust and their confidence first. You have to ask them about their lives, where they come from, how they're feeling, what they've done and everything. And um, I think we, we, we are inclined to judge people too much uh, to start with. Um, I think we have to be more sort of um, humble and uh, kind of uh, analytical to some degree, but I don't think we ought to overanalyze people about where they've come from and where they're going. I think uh, we need to be more more humble really in our, our approaches in many ways. And also, it isn't about the church. The, the church is a sort of has a loaded kind of connotations around it. It's, for some people, it's a strange building, uh, mm. the door through which they very much feared going because they don't know what goes on in there. And uh, so we, we have to be uh, out in the community too, um, in third spaces. Uh, I think that's a good thing to do. So, so do you think that we would list humility as a skill then? Yeah, as a skill to engage with spiritual seekers? Yes, certainly, yes. Um, indeed, I think it's uh, something we should be acknowledging right, right uh, up front when we make our first engagements with people. Um, uh, I think we should frame all our... Uh, questions about people's circumstances where they come from uh, within a within a humble um uh, disposition with a humble disposition even use that word so that actually uh people are, are, don't get the impression that you're actually trying to kind of shackle them or preach to them or tell them or dictate or, or proselytize uh but you actually are interested in them as people and, and i think showing an interest in someone as an individual uh outside say 
a spiritual or a faith um, setting is much more important at the outset than actually getting on with the business of actually uh, explaining who Jesus is and was uh, to them. Um, so I think humility is, is, is actually critical uh, disposition uh, and sort of sense um, and an approach framework that we need to adopt. Well, what would we do in our own lives to deepen and develop humility? I mean, you know, if we're talking about that as a skill, what, what were we going to do in our own lives to, to make that a, a deeper thing, a, a, a developing thing? Well, I think we probably need to be more honest with ourselves about um, mm -hmm. maybe the way we set about um, doing our daily tasks, uh, our, some of our relationships, um, our, our caring, how caring we are, um, how much we try, how much we actually fail to build other people up or, or succeed in building other people up. Um, these are really deep questions, actually, that uh, often yeah, we very conveniently fail to actually address uh, in our Absolutely. life. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, um, I think we need to get a self measure. Uh, if you want a self measure of humility, I think it's got to be about looking inwards um, about what we're thinking, saying, and doing as well, um, and use that uh, as a sort of marker point to where we engage with with others. What do other people think about that? What other ideas and thoughts? I'm I'm helping out on a Christian <coughs> helpline at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and we get calls from people who are suffering from suicidal thoughts, mm -hmm. um, who are actually thinking of suicide. Uh, we get people who have had bad relationships and all sorts of things. We're getting a lot of people at the moment seeking um, information about Christianity. And so we've actually started a, a chaplaincy section who are... Um, talking to those people about elements of the Christian faith but we get an awful lot of people on the helpline who have been hurt by the church yes yeah um, they've gone along they've not been sure about what Jesus is about what religion's about um, they've not been made to feel welcome mm. um, they've been judged for their lifestyles or for their mental health issues or these other things. So I think we have to be more accepting of people as well, um, because actually we're pushing people away, mm. which, is, which is is incredibly sad and and not very Christ-like. I would have I would have said. Um, so I think yes, humility is a, is a big one. Um, and I think the more I'm hearing, and I've only been doing this for for a few weeks. Um, the more horrified I am about what churches are doing to people um, mm. and, and how little they are accepting folk. Um, I mean, there was one, one lady who had been to a, um, a Bible study and she was enjoying it and so finding it helpful. And then her church, for whatever reason, decided to stop it. Right. I suggested she joined this other one. And when she got there, everybody was in their 80s they had been together as a group for several years and they didn't make her feel welcome at all. Yeah. Because she'd got some mental health issues which already made her feel paranoid, that just added to it. Uh, and so she now feels rejected by the church, uh, not just by that group, but by the church. And when she rang her church to find out why the group had been stopped, the group that she had found helpful and welcoming, and encouraging she was told well it just had to she was given no support no guidance no help um so i think we, we we really have to think about what we're doing when we make these decisions and um, and what effect that is going to have on people and and how much we welcome them into services i mean i've, I've seen someone come into a church who um, had Tourette's and made noises during the service mm. and was made uncomfortable because of that. People moved away from him. Um, they wouldn't wouldn't sit with him. They wouldn't talk to him. They wouldn't yeah. engage with him yeah. because he was yeah. odd. And that, I'm, that... 
I'm interested in, in everything you've said there, um, because it immediately reminded me when you said that you were doing this, that um, Professor John Drain, who is um, a member of my theology group, he, when COVID started, um, the Scottish government asked if people could sort of offer, you know, services to, to people uh, when the country went into lockdown. And he offered spiritual care. And he said he was completely overwhelmed by the number of people who contacted him asking for spiritual care but it became very clear to him that if he'd put as an ordained minister church care nobody would have bothered uh, it was spiritual care that people wanted and precisely the people that you've been talking to are the people who have contacted him so that that resonated with me that you know an awful lot of people out there actually want spiritual care because that's what they like to call it. The, the second thing that you, you mentioned twice was the importance of, of an appropriate welcome. And I think that is that is a very, um, a very important skill. If we're talking about skills for spiritual enablement, then, then the ability to welcome people, not in a patronizing way or in a way that kind of makes them feel that they're on the back foot is, is very important. The openness of that welcome um, and the, the kind of promise behind it that you won't be judged, that you won't be um, made to feel uncomfortable if you do put your toe in the water water is is very important because uh, 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 there's a thing on um on the website called ship of fools about um, called mystery worshiper where people go to different churches and they write about you know their experiences and i had a chat with the person who runs that site and he said he was an awful lot of the things that he doesn't publish under that mystery worshiper bit were people who who were just simply made feel so unwelcome they didn't even stay for the service um in particular he said you know there, there's people who first of all you know get very angry about where you don't do and don't sit or want to you know interrogate you about your life before you've even got through the door or worse they want you to buy something from their shop before you can come in um, there's a huge amount of sort of unwelcoming behavior which christians somehow just sort of fall into um, and that makes it very difficult for people and it's not just you know in the church door it's also in groups and bible studies like you said and other places where christians gather including in online groups where and somebody just who wants to put their toe in the water to find friends to experience something actually feels judged before they've even started and that's that's quite important so if we come back to this you know what skills do we need what do we need to be aware of i think probably the way that we do welcome would be another very important one, along with the humility that we just discussed. So thank you for that. What, what do other people think? I, I was thinking about maybe it links in with the honesty <clears throat> um, uh, bullet point, uh, but personal testimony. Mm. When, we, when we give clarity, um actually the best way to do that is through our own personal experience mm. um of where where god has helped us or where god we where god has has been you know influenced our lives or given us strength um as opposed to just giving facts sometimes when we speak from the heart and experience in that sense that can be yes be how we how we come alongside someone um almost almost to try and help them rather than taking over the conversation but just to help them yes. um you know yeah. speak and be open uh, and maybe some of those other things would just come naturally then if we were able able to just give our own personal testimonies and part of me thinks that's that's a big part of what church is missing um you know i'll often say to people oh share with me how god's moved in your life this week or is there time and nobody tells me anything afterwards and I just feel like, <laughs> I know it's not true I think sometimes we just need to reflect on that question a little bit more yes yeah. and I've been encouraged to try and start to keep a prayer diary as well yeah a lot of, well that's one of the reasons so that we can actually acknowledge God and give him the praise again when we know he's looking through for us on certain things yeah 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 uh. I think I think that's right. I, I, we probably also need to know what our limits are in terms of testimony. That there are there are things that we might not want to share because they would make us too vulnerable in in the, yes. the presence of people yeah. that you know might 
you know, hurt us in some way or, or whatever it might be. So being clear about what, what we share and what, you know, happy to share and, and what things we're still working through, for example, that can yes. also be part of a spiritual discipline. You know, how do I, how do I determine what it is I, I need to put out there and what sort of things I'm still working on? Mm -hmm. rather than just as it were offer everything and then um discover yeah. that actually I'm, I'm still working through that bit yeah i think also the reserve judgment um bullet point i think it's just kind of inbuilt on us isn't it without us <laughs> realizing sometimes it's just there it's like first impressions and i'm just conscious now we've not said hello to liz hi liz good to see you i know you've struggled to get in this morning but uh, you're welcome <laughs> Okay, so um, let, let, let me just put up this slide then and we can add the things that we've talked about into this. So what I'm suggesting here, and you may wish to challenge me on this, is the ability to listen. So listening to, to other people, um, but that listening um, has to be in a way that, that helps people because a lot, of them, a lot of them say to me, I've never told anybody this because I'm too scared that you, you'll humiliate me or that you'll tell me that I'm wrong or that it wasn't really God in my life. Um, and this is a precious you know, memory or experience that I've had and I don't want anybody to, to damage it, destroy it or you know, be rude about it. And going back to what Fiona said about people being hurt by church, this is one of the biggest ones people have been hurt by church when they've had their experiences ripped apart by somebody or some well-meaning person who hasn't listened properly and just told them they're completely wrong and that's very hurtful and um, there are you know there are better ways to go about it so that's one one ability another ability i think and we've discussed this in uh, our chat just now about holding experiences which are precious to people um, even if those come across in, in slightly odd ways. So, I mean, people with mental health issues, for example, have very precious experiences of God, but they may not, they may not come across because everybody's looking at whatever issue they've got, like the Tourette's, for example. And so again, you know, they're not, not allowed, as it were, to express those experiences because something else is in the way that we're judging. Um, another one which you may or may not, you know, you might want to challenge me on this as one of the things I feel is that we need to understand more of contemporary culture, particularly with younger people, what it is they watch on TV and on the internet, what, what they're playing in their video games. Lots of video games have spiritual narratives or they're about, um, they're about reaching some sort of higher plane or something. The, the, the way that the game unfolds, you know, has a lot, a lot to do with that as you kind of level up and so on. Um, and the range of social pressures that particularly kids and schools are under. So, you know, lots and, uh, lots, and lots of issues there um, with things like sexting and uh, revenge porn and those sorts of things. And where do you get help to, to cope with all that? Um, John Drain was saying, on the spiritual care was that he was contacted by a lot of parents of teenagers who you know are unhappy or, or worried about these kinds of things how am I going to live in a highly sexualized society how am I going to live with bullying how am I going to cope with um you know the the, the way that um things are set up in, in in sort of school life how do we actually help people with Christian faith resolve those sorts of issues um I think I think Yvonne is just um also just pointed to the ability that we we need to have to permit those stories of God to unfold and to contextualize them and I think personal testimony is probably very important in that in that process because that's a dialogue or you know a, a multi-log <laughs> um, among the people that we're talking to in which our testimony is is one of those stories which then um, you know comes into into contrast and but also into similarities with what other people are saying what God has done in their lives and um, finally I just wanted to address the the negative filter that um, has been identified by a number of sort of um, analyses of people who start out even if they don't know anything whatsoever about the Christian church with a kind of negative view of what it's all about and they have that in the back of their minds as part of their conceptual diversity and so there's a little bit about how we push back on that how we push back on people who see the church as having too much power or um, trying to control people's lives in ways they don't want or you know 
imagine all sorts of things which aren't actually true about Christian faith, but that's part of their sort of negative view of it. Mm -hmm. And when that, when you counter that, what, what do you do to enable a fair challenge to those kinds of attitudes and views when um, the church is denigrated? So those are my, my kind of ideas. To that, I'd like to add what we, we offered, you know, an importance to deepen and evolve our humility um, as Christians. Uh, that might also include a better attention to um, things like our prayer lives and ability to tell our story that, that Yvonne um, mentioned. So we've got, you know, we've got a whole range of things that we ourselves can work on, which make us more effective in these other ways. Anybody want to suggest um, anything else to add to that list? Or do you want to um, talk about anything that's on the list already? Yes. Yes. How can we reach you know, tradesmen and workers? I, deep down in my heart, I've got this feeling that so many people who work as plumbers, electricians, uh, etc. Mm -hmm. I, I, I meet very few Christians amongst that kind of work group. And I would love to find a way to connect with these people. Uh, and the what other people who, who I, I would love to connect with are, I admire the work of the, um, the BioLogos Foundation, of working with non-Christian scientists. So they could be you know, looking at two different sort of extremes there, but there are, there are whole categories and groups of people who are, seem to be have their minds closed. Mm -hmm. And sometimes with, with plumbers and, and craftsmen and artisans, you come to work in your house, you, you, you wonder what kind of, they seem so self-contained and so um, comfortable with the mm. way they operate and live and the, the control they have over their lives, that they kind of... I just feel also, I think intellectually possibly, maybe the message of the Christian church and the narrative of uh, God finding his people and leading the Israelites in, into um, the freedom of the promised land is not a narrative they would ever understand because they would never have any interest in it. And I can't engage with these people. <laughs> I just wish somebody could. I have a passion for that. I'm sure there are lots and lots of people who work as artisans. I don't want them to ever to slip through the nest. That they won't find you know get into eternity so, because because no one's ever talked to them uh, or they've never found the appetite to actually explore faith that would be an interesting thing to reflect on that would be yes that would be good particular kinds of people who we encounter uh in particular situations and you know what's what skills do we need to uh, enable a different kind of encounter to happen because again it's a kind of service requirement thing isn't it that the relationship between oneself and an electrician who comes to your home for example how would you change that relationship to something else yes it looks to me as if many are searching, as you were earlier on saying, but yeah. they don't know quite what they're looking for, and they're a little conf well, confused. I mean, even the best of us as Christians, every day we need encouragement to keep our own faith going. Sure. And even for, for those who are on the borderline, of, of which there's a very large quantity of people in that band, I, I think, it's yet harder. Uh, I feel we have a duty as Christians to, um, to um, try to engage them more in ways in which they could... Um, grow a, a faith and it's never too late um, so it's finding it's, it's in ourselves I think to diversify to them in a way that is tangible and it's manageable in their own their own perspective it's not overwhelming for them to suddenly um, change their their way of thinking and and um, begin to have a, a Christian faith it's a very large step so and it is a journey it, it is a journey it's a journey for even ourselves very much so absolutely absolutely i think I, I, it's important I, to remember i was gonna say i think that is part of the, the the welcoming attitude that we have to have that you were saying Anne, and others here were saying earlier i think that um I think I put it, you do meet christians who, who seem to almost have a, like a siege mentality you know all these new religious movements are growing up and you know and 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 we've got you know religions around us that you know that, that we don't know how to relate to and, and almost that sense of yeah we, you know we're under siege and, and i think you're know, almost like this is all a threat but i think if we could somehow see that the fact that people that, that people still do have this sort of spiritual seeking i mean however they express it whatever they're looking for but but you know people are aware that there is a, a sort of a spiritual reality it's not just about, you know, the physicality of life and the money and, you know, and all of that. To me, that's an encouragement, you know, that, that if you're, you know, sort of spirituality is alive and well, even if religion and organized religion, you know, is, is under threat. So that kind of, you know, when you meet someone to be able to say, you know, that tell me your story, 
you know, to have that kind of humility. Tell, tell me what your story is and then let me tell you mine. I, yeah. I find that very helpful, you know, that, so on the one hand, when you're saying to this person, you know, I, I do, I, I do respect, I do want to hear what your experiences are, you know, what your hopes are. You know, I take this seriously. I would like to hear from you. And I would also like them to share mine. To, to me, there's bridges to be built rather than feeling, you know, that sort of under threat, you know, all these other spiritual forces around us. Mm. If, if we could be a bit more positive and welcoming about that, I think that would make a huge difference. Yes. 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 Thank yes. you for that. Yes. yes. That's a good, very good point. Um, Shall we, shall we have a pause now? We've got to 10 past 11 for a few minutes and then we'll, we'll come back and pick up the threads of this in the next bit. Is that all right with everybody? Mm. Yes. If any, anybody's Thank burning you. to ask a question, please put them in the chat and we'll, we'll pick them up. Don't let anything get lost, but I think we'll probably need a screen break for a couple of minutes. What, what time shall we resume, Walter? I've lost Walter. Ready. Should we say, should we say 20 past? That gives yeah. us about seven minutes. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yep. Okay, are we ready to start again? Everybody back? I can't see everybody, so I don't yeah, know. I think, well, as far as we can tell. Okay, well, then I'll, I'll begin because our, our time is short. Um, you remember in the previous session uh, on one of the slides, I, I said that spiritual searching sort of comes to a, a, a dead halt when there's a life crisis. And that's when they come back and ask Christians, what have you got? Well, you can um, see COVID as a special case of that. And if anything has proved that to be correct, COVID really has, because before COVID hit, I maybe got three new inquiries a day about something to do with alternative spirituality or a new religious movement. As soon as the pandemic started and we went into lockdown, um, that went up tenfold initially to about 300 a day and then became thousands a day often people coming in groups to ask things now I've got a lot of material here so I can't I can't share it all with you because it would you know I want to have time to talk with you so I, I forgive me for the sort of little bit of a race that we're going to have but basically what I'm going to do is to describe to you the kind of roller coaster evolution of spiritual inquiry we've had while the pandemic has affected people's lives and of course it's still going on so we have a lot more to process and a lot more to make sense of but I think it's very urgent that we do. So the first phase of the inquiries that we started to get from people that had spiritual content to them was about what I've come to call panic believing. The pandemic um, hit and then you got a lot of people coming in with uh, powerful fears and anxieties about what this meant, what, what was happening. A lot of people wanted to know, is this the end of the world? Is God destroying the world? He sent the plague to, to wipe us all out. Um, did this mean there would be an imminent rapture where you know, God would take the good people away, um, maybe through death, but maybe just, you know, whip them off the planet entirely and leave everybody else to suffer and die? Was this the triumph of evil? So a lot of people asking questions about good and evil. Is this triumph of evil? This is the devil coming to, to earth and, you know, wreaking havoc upon the earth. Is it, and this is from sort of people been watching sort of zombie movies and things, you know, was this, um, was this a, a, a way of, of reducing our humanity and turning us all into subhumans? Um, was this something God would do to us um, because we're sinful or because we misbehaved or because we damaged the planet? Was it a kind of simulation for a new heaven and earth? Is this, you know, the way in which we're all sort of working with some sort of unreality? So is it really real or is it a simulation for, you know, how you sift the good from the bad? Um, were certain groups being killed off by God for some reason because he was angry with them um, and people um, reading reports right at the beginning that pets could carry the virus simply dumping them getting rid of them so this sort of panic um, uh, behavior but had a, a powerful spiritual element to it about who is God who is, you know, Satan? Is this something to do with um, good and evil having a kind of dualistic battle in which we're all sort of puppets? Um, and, and what is actually happening? So people thinking about this, perhaps for the first time, about what is good, what is evil? Why does this happen? Why do good things happen to bad people? Theodicy questions. 
The next phase was people saying, and the, the first sort of question was, am I going to die and do I deserve it? The next sort of question was, well, if I'm going to die and I really do deserve it, is there anything I can do about it? So people were coming to me and saying, what, what could I do in my sort of spiritual life to ward off, you know, getting infected by the virus? What about things like crystals, blessings, amulets, you know, protective things that have a religious content that will stop this supernatural plague from coming to me? Then people saying, well, you know, surely, why is the virus here if the faith of straight, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the faith of, of Christian leaders not good enough to stop it? Um, is, is it something about the strength of leaders? If I, you know, get, go and go to church now and, you know, become part of a Christian group or an online group of some sort of spirituality, then will that protect me? Who are God's anointed? Who are the special ones that the virus will pass over? So quite a lot of sort of harking back to misunderstood bits of the bible that sort of thing about the passover how god keeps the chosen people away from the things that will hurt them and then people coming and saying you know um what about cures for the virus um and there was a lot of sort of online spiritualities suggesting different sorts of cures like toad venom for example or colloidal silver they were selling this as a kind of uh, a spiritual cure and i had a very bad day when um president trump came out and said effectively that drinking bleach was a good idea i had to stop one woman from putting bleach in her baby's bottle because she thought that would be a, a good idea but she believed that President Trump was an agent of God, that he was sent by God to tell us how to avoid the, the virus. So that's why she was going to do it. And that was a very bad day indeed. Oh my goodness. Then you had people who uh, thought, well, maybe if you hurt yourself a bit, like cutting or bleeding or poisoning yourself a little bit, that would, as it were, ward off the worst thing, the worst death. So there was there was that sort of stuff. But that came in a spiritual package as well. You know, the kind of magic ceremony in which I offer up a bit of myself I make a sacrifice to God and uh, so that God won't come and, and cut me down and then as I say um, a lot of people reading the sort of internet stuff about uh, President Trump being an agent of God um, protected by Christians and that his word was basically God's word to um, people out here as to how to get through the pandemic. This was immediately followed by conspiracy theories about where did it come from and how did that relate to God's plan? So a lot of sort of stuff that had no basis in fact, but that people were jumping on and believing. So you had the China, the China lab theory, the 5G theory, all these masks are going up and as, you know, they're there to kill us all. Um, that it, it's to do with the Russians, that they are the agents of evil and Satan has wound them up to hurt us all that Bill Gates was behind it because he wanted to take over the world, or that aliens were behind it because they want to take over the world, or that Bill Gates is being wound up by aliens to take over the world, this, this sort of thing. Um, but against that, you have, and this is still going on, the pandemic, that there is no virus, it's completely made up to control us all, um, and that there are sort of evil powers out there that want that have been using this, this propaganda to, to make us um lose our jobs or stay in our homes or you know not go out and th this sort of stuff then a whole series of people and this is still going on about anti-vaxxers who think that vaccinations contain nanotech of some sort to control us all again if you remember what i said in the beginning about um the importance of control in people's lives the idea that someone else is going to control you by some sort of nefarious means very powerful fear then you have anti-maskers believing the same sort of thing. This is a form of control um, to make us do something, to become less than human. The QAnon conspiracy, which is all around President Trump being God's agent, that he's wiping out a satanic um, behavior in the White House that's going on all the time. 
Um, He's more like a supporter. <laughs> <laughs> you try saying that to a QAnon supporter, you <laughs> surprise what you get back. <laughs> and then a vast amount of misinformation, fake information, scams and religious fraud. So people saying that um, they could um, make the virus go away or protect you from the virus, that you didn't need to um, wear a mask, that you didn't need to stay indoors um, as long as you were part of their Christian groups. So there, were, there was a whole series of you know, Christian groups actually saying this, that, um, that if you just believed in them or went with them, that you were protected from the virus and that you didn't need to take any precautions or get vaccinated. Now, what happened there? And this is interesting because this is an evolution of, of kinds of beliefs and ideas and a spiritual quest over time. So the next thing was, who do I blame for all this? My life has been completely disrupted i can't go to work i'm on furlough i've got the kids at home who is to blame somebody must be in control of all this and somebody ought to be you know held to account for it so whose fault is it is it china is it russian is it russia is it uh, a particular government a nation that is trying to hurt us in some way or cause a war or um you know control us through computers but also a whole series of nefarious spiritual groups. So it could be aliens, but it could be the Freemasons, it could be the Illuminati, it could be the Vatican. I had all of those offered up as people that we ought to blame for the virus being prevalent. Um, is it a uh, conspiracy by the UK government to get rid of elderly people um, or BAME people? because those were the groups that were particularly at risk and were dying. So, you know, somebody must be blamed for that. Somebody must be trying to make that happen. And then you had a big flood of far right propaganda annexed to kind of Christian talk about the virus as a purge of undesirables, which is what God wants. You know, only the pure and the perfect and the people who inherit the earth, um, who, who believe their particular sort of political ideology would be the people who were spared. So that was very problematic. But you, know, you can see that people move from what can I do about it to who, who's, who do I blame for it? But what was interesting then was that you got a huge number of people, um, probably in about May or June last year, who then decided, well, perhaps there's something you can do about it by actually turning to prayer. So we've got people asking, how do I pray? Never prayed before in my life don't really you know believe in god but i need to pray i want to pray and that's interesting because suddenly you've got to move from um a thinking base how do i make sense of this in my mind to an experience base what do i do in my daily life that actually helps me cope with this particular crisis so but people who were staying at home a lot more, reflecting a lot more, having a greater awareness of themselves as uh, agents in the universe, um, coming along and saying, I want to pray now. How do you pray? Where do you start? We put out a resource on our, our website um, from the Mission Theology Advisory Group called um, how do I pray when I've never prayed before? In very, very simple terms. And what was interesting about that was you've got people asking questions about things that we absolutely take for granted. What do all these prayer words mean? Why do you say amen at the end of a prayer? What does that mean? What, what's its meaning? What is that about? What, is it, what does it do? Um, what kind of prayer works and what prayer, sort of prayers don't work <laughs> is a sort of question that I got. Um, and also people asking, well, it is, supposing I start praying to God and I get it wrong, will God hurt the people that I'm praying for? So how do, if I get it wrong, do I get punished? Very sort of simple, almost childlike sort of question, but nonetheless ones that, you know, very sort of tough in people's um, spiritual lives. I've never prayed before in my life, so maybe I'm going to mess it up and it will rebound on me or the people that I love. But once we sort of talked to people who are asking, how do I pray? What's prayer for? How does it work? What it's about? We've got people coming back and saying, actually, I did feel heard. I did feel that someone's listening. I did feel a sense of comfort. I did feel a sense of challenge about my life. And I did feel that I was responded to. And what was interesting was that people who started out saying, I'm an out and out atheist, were also people who came back and said, you know, I don't understand this, but I do feel heard. So that was a very sort of profound um, 
uh, a series of things that we were hearing about people who had started to pray just out of panic, just out of worry, just out of the sense of life crisis and not being able to help themselves, but um, wanted to do this. So this was very, very important at that point. And then we were get, starting to hear from people who'd got through COVID and were coming back and saying, I survived. What does that mean? Does God want me for something? Um, have I been spared because I'm important and elite and gifted? And you can see how individualization works in that and special. But also, does God, you know, wh why has God done this? Why does God want me? You know, um, why did I survive and other people don't? For some people, that's traumatic. That's survivor guilt. But for others, they're asking a question. Well, you know, this is amazing. I've got my life. What do I do with it now? What direction shall I take it in? Um, you know, have I been spared for something in particular? Should I change my life? What sort of metanoia, if you like, should I now, you know, try to, to work on and, and engage in? got people coming and saying you know I've got through this and now I have um, a revelation or, or a testimony I, I want to offer to you where do I put it where do who, who do I share this with that I got th through this but you've got other survivors um, or people that had lost people but survived themselves saying well you know is God really this random well, how, do, how does actually God work in this situation? And they've never considered, you know, the God who suffers with us or those kinds of, the, you know, theological perspectives about God. God was just kind of the person who just sort of says, right, time's off, you know, and time's up and cuts you off and you're dead. But they're coming back and saying, is there another way to think about God uh, in this situation? And people suffering from long COVID, why, why am I being made to suffer longer than other people? Why uh, has this happened to me? And how do I make sense of this in terms of my spirituality? And then, of course, and we're going to have to deal with this for a long time, um, the, the grief and bereavement experiences out of COVID. Um, new experiences, because for, for some medical staff, for example, they'd spend a lot more time with, in their PPE uh, with dying people than they would normally. They would hand it off to, to nurses or end of, end of care sort of processes. But actually, because of the, the problems with changing PPE so often, full PPE takes you know, time to take off, take off and put on. Um, um, we've got more medical staff saying, actually, I've never been this close to the whole death process before and reporting their own spiritual experiences, um, a sense of uh, angels being present, a sense of comfort, a sense of God being present or Jesus being present, um, things that they interpreted as signs. Um, and then themselves starting to ask ontological and existential questions about what's it all about? What's the value, meaning and purpose of life in this situation where I've been the only person perhaps who've, who's held a phone to a dying person's you know, ear so they can talk and say goodbye to their loved ones because they can't come and visit. So an awful lot of unfinished business and letting go and people who've never had to hold those experiences, the sort of experiences that hospital chaplains might typically hold, medical staff and nurses had got and a lot of anger and grief in relation to it spilling out into the sort of bereavement process not just for immediate relatives but also for everyone who'd cared for them then a lot of people um, reporting paranormal experiences um, particularly where people were separated from loved ones who got unfinished grief work the effects of prolonged lockdown as well, people being bored, hearing noises or visual disturbances just because they're at home all the time, um, and a reporting of sudden and very intense religious experiences. People coming and saying, what about, what's all this going on in my house? Is it ghosts? Is it spirits? Is it ancestors? Is it God? And trying to, to solve that for themselves by searching out supernatural um, Ex explicators so going to psychics and mediums using Ouija boards or shamans to try and find out in particular often where their loved ones had gone because they weren't able to um, be with them at the end uh, a, a very interesting thing about people reporting exceptionally vivid dreams and a lot of those saying that God had come to them or they'd seen Jesus in a dream and that they wanted to know what that was about why am I dreaming about this now and um, is, is God trying to talk to me in some way then as we got on to the uh, vaccination rollout program, we got people asking questions about it as whether it was a sign of hope that this is God had, as, as it were, had, had given 
given yeah. that the people who made the vaccines some sort of special strength or task to be able to do this. Um, was it where was God in this? Where was God actually pushing this program along? And um, also a, a series of sort of questions about people bringing in the variants, and that leading to a, a, a recycling of the, the blame believing. And the, the, is, is this God's way to freedom? Is this what God wants for people or is it actually something to be worried about? And then, as I said, we had the anti-vaxxers, a lot of them coming back and saying, really, you know, your faith can, means you don't have to get vaccinated. And we've had some strange stuff about um, the sort of sense of invasion of people's bodies by means of the, the, the vaccination, that they carry forms of control, uh, or that vaccinated people are dangerous to others, that they shed things that can hurt others, particularly around the issues of fertility and pregnancy. So now you've got a whole series about um, spiritual questions relating to bodies and how bodies relate to each other but also this fear about whether people are other people are dangerous to you or you're dangerous to people now we had all this messaging about you protect others by wearing a mask for each other but we've had these sort of questions about are are human beings intrinsically dangerous um, and and that eats away at questions of fellowship of relationship uh, suspiciousness of, of people who are different from you and you know where is God in all that what does that mean and how do I make decisions about children for example when I am afraid so I don't know, you know I don't know what to do about um, whether or not it, when it comes down the line my children would be vaccinated so in the midst of all this of course um, when churches were closed you had online online church in all sorts of places and people were coming across it everywhere in all kinds of ways and what was interesting about that was that we discovered there were a lot of spectators, lurkers, rather than participants. So you've got this, this different kind of category of people who are in, actually engaging with church. Um, a lot of people liked it if, if, if the, the videos were a bit rough edged rather than slick and, you know, re really well put together. They, they liked the things that went wrong or, you know, the cat appearing and drinking the Dean of Canterbury's milk while he was talking and that sort of <laughs> thing. <laughs> the, the sort of randomness of life actually creeping into to online worship. Yeah. Um, but then we got a lot of people who'd sort of stumbled across online church coming back and saying, well, what, what, what is all that about? What, what's going on there? Why do you do that? What, what good does it do you? So actually asking questions from the point of view of being observers rather than participants. And um, we had to ask, well, you know, is there any provision here for absolute beginners, non-Christians coming across church having no idea what any of this stuff is supposed to mean? Because quite often we don't we don't give enough information about it. We just read a Bible reading without explaining what a Bible reading is. So why, why are you reading that? What's that about? Where does it come from? How do I find it? Even if I've got a Bible, where do I find it? It's all very well saying, you know, I'm going to read from the Gospel of Luke. Where do I find the Gospel of Luke? If you've never opened a Bible in your life, you open it page one, you've got this thing called Genesis. What, what's that? You know, what's that about? So we don't we don't give provision for absolute beginners. We don't explain why we say the words that we do. We sing the music that we do um or that you know we, we we perform these particular actions or do this particular kinds of stuff what does it mean when everybody's quiet what does it mean when people say a prayer together how do i find a copy of the lord's prayer you know that sort of thing so one of the some questions of questions, sorry, sorry some of those questions for even people that have been going for years are important well, uh, no, absolutely. No, but it was interesting. You had this deluge of new questioning as we came through and, and absolutely right. These are questions that have been going on for years, but we never really sat down and thought about them properly. So um, th then we had questions, uh, a sort of question about online church. It's how do you provide that in a way that allows people to see God rather than just, you know, the cat drinking the milk or whatever it might be where 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 do people see god in that and actually know that god is there and how do you do things like which are relational like like online alpha for example which is built on relationship actually so how do you do that online um and how do you carry 
grief for physical church um, because we had a lot of people who don't go to church at all who were upset about the churches being closed but they liked to know it was going on somewhere and that was quite important we think that people who go to church were, were kind of bereaved of church but actually people who don't go to church were bereaved of church too um, particularly those who felt you know because the church door is open I could just pop in and have a sit for a minute or you know just just get out of the the rush of the world for a while and so that that deep loss was coming across um, yeah. but imperfectly articulated in terms of the spiritual search so that leaves us with some interesting questions really so what have we learned from this massive massive influx of spiritual seekers who just kind of rose up in a wave and asked all these questions and wanted to talk about what was happening in terms of life crisis and whether or not Christian faith had something to offer to, to make sense of all this, whether it was to make sense of it in your head, whether it's to make sense of your experiences, whether it was to make sense of your you know, unresolved grief because you had a bereavement, or whether it was because you've become across online church and wanted to know whether, you know, what all that was about and how you can engage with it, how to pray effectively, how to start a relationship that would get you through that. So this the massive sort of complex um response that was needed but also massive opportunity too really to under you know understand spiritual seekers because they were ready to now to talk to engage to to come and say what's your hope what how do you get through this but our biggest question my biggest question is well you know when it when it has resolved if it ever does resolve will they go silent again will they simply not come and talk to us anymore because you know they, they'll go back to whatever it was that was keeping them going in the first instance where do all those people fit in god's mission and you know how how do we remember them so that we don't sort of just forget them as some sort of anomaly because of the pandemic what what is a hope and a vision of the kingdom for them um, and where does that fit our church agenda? I mean, I'm, obviously I'm, this slide is particularly aimed at the Church of England, which has this vision and strategy and all this stuff about church growth. But the, the problem is that people of, of this kind interrogate all of those plans because there they are and they need, they need our response, they need our, our pastoral care, um, but they don't actually fit our church agenda. And that's, that's problematic. Mm. So I just have some observations about that, that the people who came to, uh, and I'm talking about thousands of people and, and with John Drain, you know, all the thousands of people that came to him for the spiritual care, they want truth. They want to know if there's something that you can absolutely rely on because there's so much conspiracy and, you know, untruth and fake news out there. They want to feel in times of crisis, loved and noticed and ask themselves, who will love and notice me when I'm in this amount of panic? And the answer is, I, I want something from the Christian church. That's what I want. And that they have stories to share about God. Lots and lots of God stories coming out. Lots of people feeling that they had encountered God in their lives, um, particularly during lockdown, where they're not engaged in the busyness of the, their usual work or whatever it might be. They've got a little bit more time to reflect or think. And suddenly there's God in their lives uh, saying things to them. And they want to share that and say, what's that about? And it does prove to us that people come to us when their spiritual pathways collapse and they seek out the church, but they don't necessarily want to buy into everything that we're offering. And what do we want? What do we want from all that? What do we offer and what difference do we make to people who have actually hit this wall, hit this crisis and come and say, why have you got faith? What's, what's your importance? You know, what's, what's the importance of faith to you? So if we're thinking about engaging as spiritual enablers um, in this very new situation and the situation that's going to unfold from now on, um, one of the things that um, I think is that we, we, we do realise now that the church you know, it, is, is it, you know, is, is permanent for us. But for a lot of people, the church has been for the pandemic. It's not for life. It's kind of temporary thing. It's like what I was saying about pick and mixing and, and the short term hope. I will lean on you now, but, you know, I'm not I'm not buying necessarily into this will last me the rest of my spiritual journey, the rest of my life. Well, how do we counter that it's like the church is a crutch that's going to get me through that's going to protect me but as soon as I've got out the other side that's you know that's not what I want 
But what are we going to do, as I said earlier, about people who are now telling us that the ties that bound me to church have been cut? I'm not coming back. Um, you know, I've been through too much. I'm not going back to the way it was. Um, I'm not. Um, I'm not going to go go back to church. I'm not going to have anything to do with church. Perhaps because I feel I've been let down, but also because I've just moved on. The pandemic has helped me move on. So I've gone somewhere else. Then there are questions about the solutions to grief um, that people go to the spiritualists or to shamans or soul journeyers for the, their solutions to grief because the church has not been available to them. Um, mm -hmm. So they will just go and um, sort out their ongoing complex bereavement and complex grief situations with other people. We've heard an awful lot about my language is not your, not your language. People saying, I've, I, you know, I looked at online church. I didn't understand a word of it. I've, I've no idea how to cope with this. I've been no instructions about how to understand it. And people saying, well, you know, the pandemic has proved to me that this is real life, that, you know, terrible things can happen and just rise up and, ha and happen. And it, you were not, uh, as unprepared for it as everyone else. So, you know, what, what's church actually got to offer me? What's Christian faith actually got to offer me? Well, I've dealt with real life now, so that's my journey. I don't need anything else. But other people saying, during the pandemic, church has been a lifeline. When it all goes back to normal, if it ever does, then please don't take that away. Um, so how do we carry on with the sort of provision that people have relied on in just sort of resuming how church works or how Christian faith works? So that's a, a new question. So um, we've got a few more minutes before the end. Um, I just wondered what you thought about that and uh, how you think that might relate to what I was saying earlier and how similarly we might add to our list of, of, of abilities and skills that we might need for the future um, now that you know we're in a different phase of COVID altogether but it's still there we're still part of it so what difference do you think that makes to the kinds of skills going forward? On the helpline, we've found an awful lot of people feel they're under physical, uh, spiritual attack. Right. Um, and even some of our listeners have felt that. And so we've True. had to set up a, 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 an extra prayer group so, to sort of support folk, really. Um, so I think, you know, some of that you were saying earlier on about, you know, people feeling under attack and, and yeah. it being some uh, evil force that's that's getting at us all. Um, moving on to the online church uh, thing, where I'm living now, there is no congregational church near me. Right. The nearest one is 50 miles away. Mm -hmm. So I have tried going to various churches around the area and I haven't really found anything that fits so for me the online church has been fantastic because I've been able to share in worship with people I know in Wales people in Devon and Cornwall people all over the world sure uh, I've been able to to um pray with cathedrals I've, I've joined the Durham community of prayer um you know various things like that so for me, I've, I've found it a real lifeline. And, and uh, if anything, it's probably strengthened my faith because I'm sharing with Christians from all around the world with different um, ways of worship. Um, and I, I think it's been really, really helpful. And I know there are an awful lot of people who have come to the church through the online church and are scared that that's going to be taken away, as you've said um you know that the, it will all stop once churches get back to yeah. normally <coughs> normally is uh, so I, I think it's important that we keep keep these things going what do other people think i think it's very important that we communicate the message to uh, both believers and non-believers that the uh, covid experience is not from god it's not God's judgment on the world um, and that there is hope within the COVID experience that uh, because of the gift that God has given us to, to medical science and other science and the way we are tackling the pandemic, that uh, he is providing us with the tools to um, uh, cope with it and to deal with it. 
I think that's terribly important because otherwise people will get this notion, oh, it's the devil, he's, he's attacking us. Mm. Um, uh, we're under attack. Well, the, the Satan's power, the power was broken at the cross. Uh, his back was broken at the cross. We know that. Although he still buffets a bit and rumbles around, he's, a, he's, he's on, 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 you know, on the way out. But we need to communicate to people that um, is, is this is not God's judgment on the world. He, he, he loves people. He's not a sadist or a tyrant. He, why would he um, inflict this on the world, uh, on his world that he loves? That's important. The other thing also, I think, is that... Um, we, I think what we have learned is that people have got together and been much more uh, kind of cooperative in terms of the way they express their sympathies for their neighbours and the, neighbor, the neighbourly behaviour got, got, um, has got going really well. And that um, church is uh, actually, uh, I think we should need to express to people, it's, it's a beautiful setting for people to come and try. Um, we should be more inviting because um, where, where we worship, we, we worship together, we listen to one another. Mm. Uh, nobody dominates. Um, we have an extraordinary range of people coming into our, our building from outside who are oh, just so untypical and unexpected. And this is how the body of Christ will be built up. And we ought to explain to people that they are a part of the body of Christ and that he, he welcomes them into his family. Um, and uh, they need to try to listen out for his voice, wherever they uh, might, might hear it. And it might not be coming from us, it might be coming from somebody else, somebody elsewhere. The other thing also is that with the other faves, I think we need the humility to carry on a dialogue. Uh, and I think that's being expressed very well during the COVID experience, because um, leaders of all faves have actually got together and talked a lot more to, to each other. Mm. And so I think that's, that's been a good outcome. So, um, yes, I think we should take the kind of the Buddhism, the Jingoism and the uh the kind of the second culture fear out of covid and, and and make it very clear that as christians we do not believe this is the judgment of god and what skills do we need to to do that effectively do you think well um <clears throat> i think uh we need to say well we should cite the evidence of our medical services our, our doctors our dentists our NA nhs our scientists uh, and our leaders um, and look at the evidence of which uh, the, the way in which this has been managed. Surely this is evidence, actually, we should be saying of God's intervention in actually helping us deal with the crisis. He's for us, not against us. This crisis has not been made by him. It's been made due to our lack of understanding, our, our, our kind of our, our mismanagement of the environment and the problems we've uh, had with the animal kingdom. We've not kept our distance enough from it. We know that zoonosis has come about um, because of this, and we're being made more aware of this by um, you know, the, the naturalists and scientists, and we are starting to learn our albeit or, or or late in the day. Um, so we need good, good, good knowledge, good then, knowledge and, yeah. and the ability to distinguish between uh, you know the fake news and the misinformation and, and yes. the conspiracy yes. theory stuff, yes. and and what you know what we need to communicate. So we have to. Have our knowledge that's quite important I think that's a positive approach uh, and i think people will welcome that um, as, as actually very encouraging um if that's coming from the church um particularly because people get so kind of uh, worried about judgment um they when they think of the church they think of god's judgment on them and of course god's judgment is ultimately on all of us uh, at some stage but we have to communicate the message of mercy the mercy of christ that's expressed in john's gospel uh, that jesus came in in um to, to onto his mission in, in to express mercy and uh, and truth mercy came first what do other people think other ideas well, I, i'm sort of coming from a, taking all of that on board and, and mm. coming from a slightly different direction i'm wondering whether it, i think this is a, an important skill that, that would go beyond this particular discussion <clears throat> but for this one too i think i think finding a way to I don't know we, to bring that to bring sort of that that gospel of grace and mercy and 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 hope, but also to be able to blend that where where it's necessary with being somehow being gracious in challenging people. I think we've got to find that balance between you know comforting and challenging. You know that because not everything you know not everything I believe, let alone anyone else, is is right. You know just because I believe it or you know, it's, um, and we may very well think that people are interpreting things in ways that, you know, we really genuinely, 
you know don't think is right but it's it's finding that way of being able to I've lost you Walter to... you're frozen up really am I am I frozen for everyone no, no, I can hear you. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yes, I, I, I'm just saying that skill of being able to, to, I mean, genuinely to to bring that sense of hope and encouragement to people, but not being afraid to find a gracious way to challenge. I think that's a skill. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. 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 Yeah. It is a skill because usually I, I was sat in in a car, in the car outside my mother-in-law's a couple of weeks ago. And there was a guy pushing about three or four Morrison's trolleys back towards Morrison's. So I don't know what made me, um, maybe it was something from God, I'm not sure. Um, but I just shouted, not shouted like literally, but you know, called him out the window and just said, oh, thank you for doing that. You know, that's, that's great that you're taking all those trolleys back. Well, oh my goodness, that was it. Like half an hour later, he was still <laughs> chatting to me. His main, his main thing was about COVID and how I should, I should beg forgiveness and repent that I'd had the um, vaccine because um, I'd now damaged my body. I now had, I now had three, three strands of DNA and um, <laughs> the wrath of God was upon me. And, and the, he he told me he was a believer he believed in Jesus because that's how I brought it up he started to go on about it and I was like well you know I trust in Jesus and you know I'm going to keep my faith in him and then it all went wrong <laughs> he just started to go crazy at me um and it is, Walter is exactly right you have to have that strong graciousness to be able to I mean Anne I don't know how you do your job my goodness me um to be able to you know throw it back in a way that is strong, that is clear, uh, and that mm. is gracious. Mm. Mm. Um, and then I just prayed loads for that guy there after. <laughs> just, but, but also for ourselves, because, uh, you know, I find that there are so many opportunities to be able to share um, our faith if we only had the confidence and if we also had something that we carried around with us that we were that we we were confident in and that was clear to be able to say oh why don't you have a little read of this or why don't you come to my church on a Sunday or you know I think we need that backup don't we almost it's like that very first bullet point that we talked about when we talked about clarity it's being able to have that clarity. But if you don't believe me, take this and have a little look at this and reflect on this. And there's a number or um, you know, there's somebody that you can contact uh, as well. So, um, and I think when, when we think about how we hear God and how we listen for God, that's, that's at the heart of when we need to hear his voice the most clearly when we're in these situations that just are opportunities for us to be able to share and our reliance on the Holy Spirit to give us the words to be able to speak. I think that's really important because you can't accompany everybody for the rest of their lives in their faith journey. You, you have to, as it were, hand it off and over to God, but to give them a next step. It, 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 it always um, fascinates me that you sometimes hear a long time down the line how something, a kernel or seed that you've planted with somebody has come to fruition in a different context. But you did that. You, you put it there. But then they, they need to go on and develop it perhaps in other contexts. And you have to go to kind of trust that God will do something with that. Um, but I think we can always have in our minds the next step for a person whether that's, you know, and, and, and to certainly to back all that up with prayer afterwards, to pray for those people, that, that God will do something with the words that we've spoken or the actions that we, we've made or whatever it might be. And I, I think that's, that's, that's very important to the relationship that we have in ourselves with God and how we um, go on on our own journey. Can I ask you something, Anne? Is yeah. okay to ask? I'm just thinking about, you know, the, 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 you know, the ministry, the service that you have there, and you know, you were saying that you know, thousands of people have been in touch with you, certainly yeah. since the COVID, you know, since the past 15, 16 months, whatever. Yeah. It's just, I suppose, are you the person or are there, is there a team of you, as it were, that receives it's no. emails and phone calls? And, and do you actually reply to people? Or because I'm with Yvonne on this, it sounds absolutely monumental. 
the responsibility? First of all, there's only me. And secondly, it's one of the things that's been very interesting is how it's happened. So that people don't email me, they, they find me on social media. And what happens is that they send me um, private messages on, on Twitter or Facebook or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. so they, don't, they don't put it in, you know, out for public consumption. But one of the things I realised very, very quickly with all these sort of huge deluge of people coming in is that you've got one person, but sometimes you've got a whole group of them behind the one person. Mm -hmm. So you've got one person who asks a question and you, you reply. And at, at the beginning, I had a series of set replies that, you know, I would offer to people, which I then customised to whatever the question was. Um, but then it was, it my, my, you know, my friend here wants to know that. So there'll be a whole series of supplementaries and follow ups for a whole group of people who were in a family or in a school mm. group or whatever it might be. So the, it, it's interesting, you have a whole, whole sort of wadge of people, but at its height just after lockdown started i started to realize first of all they had to triage what was coming in so the people who are going to hurt themselves had to be the people that i replied to first the people who are going to drink the bleach or whatever it might be so anybody who's going to physically harm themselves mm -hmm. or was feeling suicidal i had to find help for and my i think i've said before in other things that i've done with you walter that i tried to push mm -hmm. inquiries to local level yeah. a lot of people don't realize they can go and talk to a local minister they can but they don't know that they can so if i, I said to them this is how you find somebody who's really local to you and you can go and talk as much as you like about this to them and they won't say no and if they came back and said oh you know didn't get an answer were too busy or something I'd find them someone else so it was handing off to local parish priests mm -hmm. one thing or another but uh, I mean as time went on one of the things I think Yvonne sort of mentioned was I had to be very careful I didn't get too tired and just you know got snappy with people um, that graciousness, you know, can run out. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I had, there were, there were times I had to think, you know, I'm too tired to do this. I'm not going to give what people need. So I've got to, you know, just step back a little bit and wait until I feel better rather than just say, oh, for God, goodness sake, you know, don't, that's so stupid, you know, <laughs> conspiracy <laughs> theories that into. I can't afford to do that. So that was, that was a sort uh, of learning process as well. I did have a threshold at which I really couldn't, give what they needed and I had to sort of step back yeah. and wait yeah. so yeah. that that was a that was a learning thing as well when you've got a real deluge of people because obviously it snowballs if people come to you on social media they then tell their friends and then their friends come to you and say you know my you you said this to my friend I want to ask this question or I want to talk about this experience so you know that's that's really how it happened and I had to work out how best to serve those people in that that way and to make sure I had a quick handoff to local level. Gosh. I guess that's I was going to say another skill but it, it, maybe it's about resources because that is important isn't it knowing knowing how to pass people on to people who can give them better support or further support yeah. or whatever mm -hmm. uh, because I can imagine you know someone comes to you and you speak to them and, and you, you give what you can and maybe it really is good you know and 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 you sense that God is in that and you've been helpful, but then, then what? Or, or someone comes to you with a really serious issue, you know, and you just don't have the skill, you know, yeah, yeah. counselling or safeguarding yeah, or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You have to know when you can't, you know, you're not the person to do that. You've got to be able to know how to hand it off and in what way and to make sure that they are, you know, they do get served at that end because I did have clergy. So I'm just too, too tired and too busy with this to, to take this person on or to talk to this person. And if they said that I'd find someone else, but I had to just, make sure that they were getting the, the service that I promised as it were in, in you know because I'd make these extravagant promises that you know here is somebody really local to yeah. you who, who will care for you and I promised that to you so I had to make sure that that was a true promise. Mm. That's something we maybe yeah. need to think about Yvonne about that you know building up sort of really approachable networks of, of people that perhaps yeah. we could recommend to people, <clears throat> if you see what I mean. Yeah, and I think there's two things there. That the first thing um, is to um, encourage churches to have that list of those different people to be able to connect to, mm. you know, a wide variety of. Um, and I've got a template mm. for that actually that I did um, on a course a couple of years ago. So I'll try and dig that out. But the second thing is maybe in churches' defence, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be. Um, 
you know, I'm not trying to defend in one sense, but at the same time, uh, be real about the situation that we have in churches that we just don't have the resources to support all of these people, which is why I think sometimes we do mm. end up hurting people and we do end up not being able to provide for people because um, we haven't got that list or we haven't got all of it. We try and do it ourselves and then we let people down and we haven't got that ability or we haven't got that um resource to be able to say you need to go here or you need to go there um yeah it's just a fence which you know i think i could uh, i could right. send you yvonne um sorry i could send you a, a list of um organizations that the christian helpline i'm on yeah, uses okay. to signpost yeah. people to um, that'd be helpful thanks fiona they're all, they've all got christian you know leaning so yeah. uh, I'll, I'll send you that I mean, we, we've been really blessed to be able to put these if only events on and um, we've done, this is our third kind of um, theme, if you like, well, what do you call them, Walter, streams, yeah. <laughs> our third stream, um, when we thought about this. And we have got um, a pot of money as well that we want to make available. What we wanted to do for these sessions is, is to make them... Um, uh, like an action like something to do so what could you do what could you take away from this session um and what is it that you could then share uh, if you're able to make the session in august to encourage others you know we wanted to give you like a springboard and actually this is a perfect thing to be able to do for your churches that you have got that contact list but if there is something that you think oh actually we could buy some try praying booklets and we could buy the just try praying i don't know whether you've heard of this organization but they produce lovely books that anybody can just take. Um, and they can, you can also buy a plastic uh, waterproof box that you put on the railings of your church so that you can put them in and people can just then take them out. Um, so small projects like that, um, we've got yeah. some funding that if you wanted to look at that for your church or there was a book that you wanted to get that might help you again, um, discern this um, work and, and support the community then please do get in touch with us and I'll send you that form as well afterwards uh, sorry and I didn't know whether you I just want I thought that was just important to say that at that point no absolutely no and very important to take away something practical to do definitely these were the little I don't know whether you heard of this try praying but they, these are the mm. little puts from try praying and they are quite quite thick and um, but you, they are kind of pocket size mm. something that you carry around as well and they've got the it is a national organization but I think it's 250 pounds and I think you get 100 and then you get this perspex solid box that you can just put on the railings and a banner mm. so that if you know I, I thought that was that was what really touched me as well that people were concerned that the churches had been closed um, you know that was quite touching you don't realize even just as a building because i i pray that quite a lot that buildings even though they're just buildings she says are a magnet for people you know that they are seen as a place of of welcome and safety within the community yeah. and people within communities have, have felt quite, <laughs> quite um sad that the church is closed and worried about that you know, as churches, we have the responsibility of making sure people know that actually, although we're not meeting there physically, we are still communicating. Still happening. Or saviour, and yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that could be one way. Indeed. I had somebody say to me, "Well, if God exists, why hasn't He got rid of the got rid of the virus?" Mm. Um, and you know, that's such a complex question, isn't it? in so many ways that we, we we've got to answer yeah yeah, yeah. You know, uh, uh, and uh they think because you know you're christian you have the answer well actually we don't always have the answer do we uh, and we have to admit that um and we can we can point to things which might give some of the answer but but actually we don't have the whole answer um <coughs> And each one of us would probably come up with different things that we would say to somebody if we got that question. Um, so maybe even that's that's a project. If someone says to you, "Where is God in this back in this in this virus?" Can we have a list of of ideas that you know we can give people? 
Mm. Um, I think we really have moved on since the pandemic began because people have begin, begun to take on a, a new take a new look at life and realise that they can put aside desire for all these unworldly things which they relied upon before to make them happy or make them feel content um, and realise that the life itself is preservation of life is the most important thing and, and those all those around them those that are important to them protecting them from from the disease so th there's much more to life than just <coughs> the next quick fix as you might put it or acquisition <coughs> to, mm -hmm. to to other things which don't in the end fulfill you so Absolutely. i'm sure everyone's had a bit of a a learning curve on, on this uh, you know being trapped in our homes no freedom to to mix or blend with others um so many confinements if you like has, has has taken an effect on, I should think, every person in some way or another. So I think we shouldn't beat ourselves up too much. I, I think people have moved towards looking for faith, probably a lot more closely than we'd ever give ourselves credit mm. for, because mm. we need um, something out there to to aspire to, 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 to save us. So I, mm. I believe that we've moved forward in a way. I mean, there's a short answer to where is God within this pandemic, surely it must mm. be all the care and attention given to sick patients in the hospitals and care homes by caring people, uh, with the provision of our scientists to study and analyze the genome that's uh, created this virus, and the response to the vaccination program. This is all evidence of God at work. And this is what I, what I would be telling people. Um, God has given us this gift of science to actually analyze and understand the way the human body works and to deal with disease. And so this is evidence that he cares. Prima facie evidence that he cares. I mean, we, we believe in a God that could come down and intervene and he could just say, wipe it away. He could appear in a flash of lightning and take the virus away. This is not the way he chooses to do it because he's, he's in, empowered us with knowledge. This is the knowledge that uh, was talked about in Genesis when we fell. The irony is that we fell, we acquired this knowledge, but after all this time in God's plan, he's allowing us to put this knowledge to good use. Mm. Given us the mm. ability to distinguish between how we use it too, so we use it ethically. Um, so we have more, the whole science and, and, and social science of ethics within medicine today. Mm. Um, so th this is even more evidence that God is at work and at present uh, in, uh, in and amongst all this. As well, He gives us this um, knowledge and this power through science. He also gives us the ability to uh, use it well in, in, in his name. Um, and within the framework of his own values. And I, w I wonder if I could ask you to um, say a little bit about what you'll be presenting for us when we return in August, for those who, who are able to return in August, you know, how, we're follow how you are following through and following on with this. I mean, we'll have the programme, those are, you know, if we've had the, uh, the, the, sort of the, the poster, as it were, the programme's on the back, um, which also has the August, but um, I wonder if you might say a bit about mm. that. Yes, what I hope to do is to talk about um, some work we've done in the Mission Theology Advisory Group called Five Themes in a Theology of Evangelism. So what it does is to look at um, faith sharing in, in and the skills and abilities that we've talked about today so I actually I made a list of these so I can sort of take them forward into the next thing about humility welcome testimony and prayer encouragement um, mercy how we challenge people and empowerment of others and the five themes are um, what we call first of all pursuing the, the human so we look at or I will be looking at um, what does it feel like today not to be Christian so I've given you some background to that in this session what it feels like not to be Christian and not to have any kind of background in, in Christian faith and therefore to identify what kind of people are first of all best equipped to uh, um, engage with people who don't have any of that kind of knowledge or background the sort of people who are for coming across online church and saying I don't understand any of that what's that about so who who are the people who understand what that feels like who are the people who can talk about that and how do we equip them if it's not us and similarly um how do we then um 
continue that relationship? How do we make that work? So that's the first one that I want to talk about. The second one I want to talk about is a piece of research that we did that shows that Christians are really good at making community. I mean, starting community and making those relationships in relation to, as it were, the, the average part of the population. But often Christians don't realize that they have those skills. And so I've been looking at where those skills come from and how you turn those very fragile beginnings that we encounter in daily life, which are the beginnings of making community, of making relationships, um, of imparting something of our fellowship to other people that we encounter in daily life. And here I'd come back to what Mark said about workers, for example, your, your plumbers and your electricians, um, that those sorts of people, how you make start to make community with them how does that work how what sort of skills do we need to um, make sure that those tissue thin relationships when they're started off don't wither away how do you actually keep those going then we're going to have what uh, I'm going to talk about um, a theme which is making new news and there the sort of thing that I ask is um, what kind of situations in today's society are um, very new that we ourselves haven't encountered but which our, our children and grandchildren are going to encounter post covid is one of them but also the environment but also the, the kind of work stresses there are today and the way that the future of work is going to change because a lot of people are going to go in for hybrid working now they're going to stay at home a lot more um, what are the particular stresses of that how do people solve those and what does christian faith have to do with that to to help people get through those kinds of experiences therefore how do you equip say younger people to be a beacon of christian hope in those situations where people are solving the stresses by taking drugs or spending all their money on you know frivolous things or whatever it might be how do, how do we actually create new news for people the good news which is ultimately the good news of jesus christ then i will talk about um uh, honoring memory so what is it in a person's past that is it that demonstrates what god has done to bring them to a point where they make a decision for christ where they want to be part of the christian community and how often the church doesn't want to know about it so you know just to kind of treat people as you become a christian great nothing else matters what what it is about memory that actually drives certain kinds of spiritual experience spiritual journey and on which people reflect and it and it helps to deepen their faith and do we sometimes overlook that and just pretend it doesn't matter or we don't want to know particularly if it was a difficult past or perhaps one with a lot of um, problems that we, we don't want to know about like mental health issues or somebody who's been in prison that sort of thing and finally um, I want to talk about how we are the face of God to others now actually um, I've laid the background for an awful lot of that today you know how how because of the pandemic how because of the the helplines that we've had to, to man the volunteer the food banks and so on how are we the face of God to people and what makes a difference between say just being a social service and being Christians expressing our faith in those situations. What, what, what is it that matters to people? And why does it make a difference in their search for faith and their ongoing journey as the explorations of being Christians? So that's how I'm going to be taking this forward. I've laid the background about what's in people's minds and experiences, how they, um, what they want from their spiritual lives and how they've been um, progressing that, but also how COVID has really slapped that in the face and how that's brought people to new questioning new um and the need for new answers and new news yet again and i'll jump i'll be taking that into the next forward bit which is about how practical applications of our faith um and how that informs and um progresses evangelism so i hope that's of interest to you and you know, i'll see you back there when we do that because it'll be mm. fun <laughs> <laughs> yes thank you mm. any oh. um I, any final, I was going to say any final comments from somebody who's perhaps not said anything so far, I'm not trying to press anyone to say that, absolutely not, but just in case, if you haven't said something, please do. Uh, a question for Anne, if, mm. if I may, it, it's probably out of the topic, but okay. when, when churches come together to work with the community mm -hmm. to spread the gospel, what do you say, have you come across any differences within the church groups themselves that needs to be addressed, that needs to be um, sorted out? Um, 
it's, so we're it's, talking it's, about ecumenical working yeah 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 uh well i mean those are the age-old et- ecumenical questions aren't they about yeah. um differences of emphasis um mm. what, what we share in common but also that the expressions of it are different so there's mm. various things to tease out there one is about how we present ourselves as a Christian denomination, for example, or as a Christian group or a fellowship. Um, Others are about different forms of emphasis in, say, what we do out in the community. So there are some which are more aggressively evangelistic, you know, I I give you this that you may respond in this way, and others that, as it were, prefer to sort of step back and let God do the work so there are differences of emphasis in in yeah. you know, how that works and how sometimes those grate against each other um yeah. and the, one of the you know other underlying things is whether or not we think it matters if a person who wants to become a Christian joins a different denomination than that of our own <laughs> so there's that there's that sort of question of you know where do people go and are we happy for people to go wherever they feel most comfortable or where they feel most welcomed or at home and we're willing to let them go if that's what they they want to do so that we don't as it were end up fighting over territory or sheep or whatever it might be those are very interesting questions and we've been working on those a long time and they're always there so you know it's interesting but to be fair I think there is probably better cooperation and understanding than we used to have but um, I did do a piece of research um, a few years ago in which I asked people from congregations not not church leaders but people from congregations from different denominations to go into each other's churches and try and think if they were brought a non-christian friend could they explain what went on there and it was very interesting because they very often couldn't you know what's this swimming pool doing in the middle of this church? <laughs> that sort of thing it was, it was very interesting my my, my, fav- my favorite thing was that um, i had a, a, a little a little old hundred year old roman catholic lady who used to clean the, her her local church her own church a roman catholic church and and dust all the statues you know and all, all the rest of it and she went into um, a sort of local pentecostal church in which there was nothing at all except a plain table and a, a load of chairs and she sort of looked around and she said well I don't know what they do in here, but it could do with a good clean. We have um, um, an event in on the 13th of August and the churches in the community in Wandsworth, London. Uh, we have a meeting, virtual meetings, and right. I've noticed some differences within ourselves. Like for instance, I met, uh, a few days ago, I met one of the new reverends who come to the area who's, who, who's interested in the project and wants to work and wants to be actively participate in what we do. And then we had a meeting and he had a meeting with the uh, Church of England um, uh, vicar mm-hmm. and with, uh, with the Catholic priest with those. And then we had a meeting. And then from the conversations we had, I sort of sensed that so and so does not understand me position. So how I I think because we're doing it together, and then uh, as you said, we have expectations from outside of the Christian group where there are some um, um, spirituality sects that compete with Christianity, and then within ourselves we have this tension if i call it understanding and then sometimes there's no there's no platform where we can come together because we're involved in doing something and then that affects how we do it what we expect from it and things like that so Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you won't have you won't have space or you won't have the time to address those things and then to do those things because there's an event, you, you, you're meeting people, and then sure. if we try to be practical, it might take a long time to, to do that. But um, what, what, do your, what, what do you suggest when we go out to the event? Because we have, we can, as you said today, we have different expectations, we have different understandings of we, who we are. Um, and on the, on the poster, we haven't used any church word any right yes yeah so 
And then there are some people involved in the work, in the project, who are not churchgoers, who are not Christians. Sure. So we're very careful when we did that, but we still have differences within ourselves and we still have different ways of addressing the people. Some of us might think they have to come to our church. There's there's also this competition where you want us, you want them to come to your church, not to that church. Yeah. And this is all behind the you know, yeah. seen, so. uh, well uh, to be honest i think if we go back to the um the kind of principles for engagement that we've looked at in relation to spiritual seekers we need to apply those to ourselves as well yeah. um and that that does have to do with with humility and and clarity and and information and judge you know not judging others and so on but um being clear and honest with each other unfortunately of course um, i i just between you and me and the gatepost i sometimes think christians are worse than that than when we're talking you know to spiritual seekers but, yeah. you know, we have a, we, we have a gender so we you know we, we tend to put those principles by the by so we can take our agenda forward we need to stop mm. that mm. Mm. i think it's the it's come time for us to release anne into her, the rest of her day and release the rest of us into the rest of our day. Um, um, we'll be sending out reminders about the August meeting in due course, won't we, Yvonne? Although people do have it in their sort of the diaries and, and, and yeah. have a note of it. Um, but we will be reminding people of that. And, and do, um, you know, when you're reflecting on what we have all been reflecting on today, um, you know, make, make some notes to yourself, you know, if there's things that you want to bring up. I'm saying this on behalf of Anne, I hope she'll forgive me. But, you know, things, you know, questions or comments or suggestions that you could bring when we do meet again. Because although the next session will be, you know, it, it will stand on its own feet, as it were. Um, it's, it, it is, of course, a, a follow on and a follow through from what Anne has been sharing today. So we're, we're sort of anticipating that there will be follow through in our own thoughts and prayers, you know, between now and then. Mm. So um, do, do sort of keep it alive in your hearts and minds and and, uh, and be ready if you are coming back, which we hope you are, uh, with perhaps some others who weren't able to be with us today, that uh, we can share that together. Is that okay, Anne? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. no, perfect. Okay. I was just going to say, should we spend just the last couple of minutes? And yeah. it's 31, but should we, should we give the last couple of minutes to God in prayer? Yeah. And pray for some of these situations and, and, um, and uh, go from there. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for this time. I, I'll just do a bit of an introduction and an open prayer if people want to pray out loud as well. That's absolutely mm -hmm. fine. And Lord Jesus, we just thank you for this time together. We thank you for technology and and for Anne's wisdom and Anne's sharing this morning. Lord, we just wait expectantly to hear from you. We thank you that you are our amazing God who created this whole world, but are just interested in us as much as anything. And so we come to you this morning with open hearts and we give you the conversations and the thoughts and we pray that you will speak loudly to us in how you want us to share the good news of you with others and who you want us to share that good news of others with. Thinking about all the different uh, aspects and complications and issues that people have. Lord Jesus, we just pray for all those people who have come to Anne over this last 18 months or so, uh, in some way or other, confused, scared, um, fearful um, because of this pandemic. For all those people who are searching, all those people who are struggling, we just pray that you will continue to reveal yourself to them and that they may come to know you as their Lord and Saviour. Lord, empower us, give us confidence to be able to share the message of you with others. And we pray for electricians and plumbers and opportunities to be able to share with them. And for others that we might meet in the community. Lord, we love you and we trust you and we turn to you expectantly. Amen. 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 Sorry, I just wanted to pray for Jonas as well. I knew there was something else. So we just pray for Jonas. We pray that you'll give him wisdom and that actually he will just be himself. He will share of you in all of those conversations, all of those um, meetings and gatherings, and that actually 
all that anyone will see is you, Lord Jesus, through the work and the speech of Yona. Amen. 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 Thank you. So, thank you everyone for being here with us today. And thank you so very much for, for sharing you, the... Uh, well, you've been, sharing a, you've been sharing of yourself as well as sharing all this resource and, and we're very grateful for that um, thank you, you Anna. And to yeah, we, we pray protection over you Anne thank you all of you thank you very much and it's oh. a, a blessing and thank you for the invitation no no it's a, a real pleasure to have you Anne I'm going to ask this question because I know mm. otherwise Yvonne and I will get emails from now till next Thursday are you willing to share the slides that you've shared this morning yeah. yes absolutely yes yes, yes yeah I'm a, there's a great. bit of a profit in me i knew that was going to come <laughs> um, so if you're genuinely sure about that um, absolutely then uh, we'll we'll send them out to everyone who's been here today so you'll have those slides um, thank you uh, oh, God. It's thank a great you. pleasure thank you thank you so much thank you so much thank you thank you, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Bless you. Bye. Bye. Bless you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.